Hi everyone, this is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He is YouTuber and journalist David Seaman. Thank you for joining me again, David. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Jason. Now, David, we're about two months into Donald Trump's presidency. In your opinion, what has he done right so far in, the, in his first two months? What has he done right? Uh, well, before he even took office, he succeeded in having the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, scrapped. Uh, I think he's done a good job of pushing back against false media claims about Russia. I think, uh, for the most part, his picks have been excellent. I think uh, it was a smart and untraditional move to pick the CEO of ExxonMobil, one of the you know foremost oil and energy companies, to pick him to run the State Department was definitely kind of a maverick move, but I think it's one that might pay off for us because, you know, what does the State Department do at the end of the day? They're supposed to be about uh, securing and maintaining our access to energy, among other things. Uh, so that was a cool move. I think it's neat to see him look outside of the box. Uh, so overall, I'm very impressed with his messaging, and I'm impressed with him following through on uh, many of his promises, including, uh, you know, tightening immigration policy. Uh, yeah, Tillerson, they claim he doesn't have any experience, but the man has negotiated, you know, economic deals for ExxonMobil and favorable trade deals and contracts in pretty much every single country on the planet. So I don't know someone who has more experience going into a country and trying to negotiate a favorable trade deal than Rex Tillerson does. Well, exactly. He brings all of that experience to the table. And it, it's just funny how, you know, the Democrats are saying he is unqualified. I think Stephen Colbert uh, has been screaming at the top of his lungs how unqualified most of Trump's, Trump's uh, cabinet picks are. Yeah, it's insane how hysterical uh, Stephen Colbert and John Oliver have been since the election of Trump. It's really crazy that they didn't see this coming. Uh, if you were to leave L.A. or New York or D.C., or, uh, you know, Toronto, if you're living in Canada, if you were to leave those places and just take a cross-country drive uh, at any point in the last eight to ten months, it would have been obvious that Trump was going to win, you know, because when the economy as is, uh, when the economy is as bombed out as it is in some parts of the country, uh, there's no way that people are going to vote for the establishment pick, right? So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so guys like Stephen Colbert and John Oliver are basically very highly paid clowns. You know, they're meant to keep the status quo and make exactly. fun of certain things. Yeah, you they're, know, like, they're like uh, court jesters, you know. A lot higher pay than court jesters, and, you know, court jesters were executed. So I don't see I, – I see those guys, you know, <laughs> they're, they're in a lot better situation than the average court jester. <laughs> Good point. Uh, well, uh, that's a great point about Donald Trump uh, winning so many uh, – so much of the United States. I think he won – 95 percent more than 95 percent of all the counties uh hillary clinton won the city so you know this is why our founding fathers set up the electoral college to protect here uh to protect against tyranny of the majority and you know a couple handful of cities basically deciding our as overlords running the entire country so you know new york city washington dc chicago los angeles san francisco chicago trying to protect uh, against them basically deciding what the entire country has to do. Yeah, it was an interesting system they set up. It seems like it's serving us well. Uh, yeah, and and the, uh, uh, the regardless of what the people are, are saying on Twitter, all these Democrats that they, you know, every other country has a popular vote and they want to get rid of the electoral college. And, uh, you know, Hillary has talked about running again. I don't, I don't think she's going to be healthy enough to run again in four years. What about you? <laughs> No, I, I think her health uh, was never a conspiracy theory. I think she could drop at any moment because, you know, she had a concussion in 2012. Some people think she never fully recovered. Uh, and, yeah, I don't think she's in good health. And I think there's probably a lot of stress from knowing the Clinton Foundation is going to be, you know, scrutinized over the next four years. I want to ask you now about uh – what Donald Trump has done wrong, in your opinion? Is there anything that Donald Trump hasn't done that you wanted to see done already? Uh, I think it was kind of an unexplained move, uh, him getting rid of Gen General Flynn. I think it unnecessarily chummed the waters and showed this hostile media that if they attack one of Trump's picks hard enough, Trump will discard them potentially. Uh, so I think that getting rid of General Flynn was a bad move when many people considered him to be 
the total opposite of a globalist or a you know military industrial type even though he was in the military uh, he had a very pro-american view on things uh, so that to me was i don't want to call it a mistake but it's a move i still don't fully understand uh other than that, of course, I would have liked to have already seen high-level and high-profile arrests regarding this Pedogate stuff that has come out through the uh, John Podesta WikiLeaks. I would have liked to have seen that by now. But uh, for the most part, there haven't been that many blunders. It's been a very competent uh, first couple months for the president, in my opinion. That's interesting. And, you know, if you listen to the mainstream media, especially the Clinton News Network and CNN, it would say the exact <laughs> opposite. I think MSNBC has turned into, you know, this this neo McCarthyism witch hunt, uh, basically, where, you know, they run all these crazy stories alleging Donald Trump's a Russian spy. I, I can't tell you how many trolls I've had to block on Twitter who are hardcore Democrats who are, despite the lack of any evidence whatsoever, are adamant that Donald Trump is a Russian spy. Well, it, it's so scary because, uh, well, it's scary and funny. What's funny is when you watch CNN nowadays, if you have to watch it while you're walking through an airport or while you're taking a leak and they have it you know, on in the bathroom TV, uh, if you have to watch CNN, I've noticed the production quality has dropped. Like half the time it seems like it's just somebody recording from a handy cam almost with some cheap lower third graphics. And I wonder if they're already cutting their production expenses because so much – less of us are watching. And those of us who are watching are just watching it drunk or something to make fun of it. Uh, I wonder if it's already eating into their, their overall business model, the fact that the president calls them fake news, the fact that we don't trust them. Uh, but yeah. That, that was very interesting. You brought up uh, what happened to General Flynn. You know, I, I think there's a lot of evidence there that uh, Flynn was illegally spied upon because the transcripts were released. How did the mainstream media, you know, get that information? In your opinion, was Trump and his transition team, including General Flynn, illegally spied on? Uh, I think it sounds like Obama was illegally spying on many people. And so knowing how petty Obama has been in light of, you know, some things he's done to journalists, the guy has spied on various journalists and activists. We know that for a fact. Why would he not be spying on Donald Trump, who at the time was this vocal billionaire critic of the president? Uh, and, and also, like, Trump's not going to say something like that and then not be able to back it up. He has access to all of the intelligence agencies and these crazies on the left at MSNBC, as you mentioned, and on CNN, who are spinning up this narrative that Trump made that up. He has access to everything. He's really the president. He's not trying out for it. You know, it's not like the election is happening next week. Uh, the election happened last year. And so they really do have to move on. Uh, I'm sure he has a piece of paper that shows the authorization to spy on him in particular. And of course, Obama was violating millions of people's rights with the NSA programs. So I have no doubt of what Trump says there. Yeah. And uh, did you see that Jerome Corsi was on Infowars and Alex Jones? And he actually had, you know, the declassified documents with a report showing that Donald Trump had been, you know, intentionally targeted, I think, uh, even during George W. Bush. And Obama had uh, picked that up, too. So uh, Trump was being spied on. I guess they had targeted him uh, for political reasons. They had figured that he was eventually going to run because he had gone to CPAC in the past and spoken at conventions. And, uh, you know, even before he announced he was running four years before that, I figured he would eventually run at some point. So he was just uh, waiting for the right opportunity to run. Oh, wow. That's wild. Makes sense, though. It makes sense that if they thought he was a threat, they would start to spy on him early on. Yeah, did, did you see the interview from former CIA officer uh, Colonel Tony Schaefer where he said that it was very likely that uh, Trump was wiretapped uh, or at least illegally spied on? And he called the cover-up even worse than the crime. He said this is worse than Watergate. That was wow. uh, a couple days ago. No, I didn't see that, but I think I follow him on Twitter. I think he's uh, like spooky something is his name on Twitter. Uh, yeah, so that's interesting if he's making that claim, for sure. Yeah, he was on Fox News, so the mainstream media is not going to talk about it because we know that a lot of Democrats, you know, are brainwashed. They won't look at Zero Hedge. They won't look at anything <laughs> on Fox News. Uh, it's really sad, David, how— No, you know, it, is, it is sad. All they do when they see my YouTube videos, within a minute, they just report it or they close out the window. And uh, it's like they don't want to address any of these things that are real. They want to focus on this alternative universe of the— the, you know, Russia caused the election to be hacked nonsense, which if you want to talk about 
you know, baseless conspiracy theory. That is a baseless conspiracy theory, and it's just being kept alive by confirmation bias and by desperation. Uh, but what is not a baseless conspiracy theory are all of the corruption uh, allegations and all of the child trafficking and human trafficking allegations that are swirling around the Clinton Foundation and uh, swirling around Podesta. That stuff to me is not baseless. And yet, you know, MSNBC and CNN are driving this narrative into the ground that Russia is somehow uh, either influencing our elections, which is a ridiculous claim because elections are quite decentralized. All these different uh, counties and boards all across the country, very hard to hack the election. Uh, and just, you know, preposterous claim. Our NSA is way more well-funded than all of their uh, kind of dark hacking operations. So, yeah, it's it's desperate. Yeah, I, I think when I when I looked into uh, people with connections to Russia, uh, it's very obvious that we have the Clintons were involved with Russia. Bill Clinton, I think, was paid five hundred thousand dollars to give a speech by a Russian bank that's tied directly to Putin. That uh, that he's like oh, it's it's obscene. The Clintons always accuse their enemies of that, of which they're doing themselves to buy themselves some time. And once you figure out that that's part of their playbook, it's hilarious because they try to do it to us. And it's like, wait a second, what about the uranium Podesta deal? Yep. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> exactly. This this is classic rules for radical Saul Linsky is you, whatever you're doing bad, you blame your enemy on it first and move the direction that way and take the pressure off yourself and go on attack that way. Yeah, exactly. And I, I kind of lost track when I was going on this ramble a second ago, but uh, it's also just offensive to hardworking Americans, this notion that Donald Trump, who's a self-made billionaire, I know he started with a few million dollars from his dad or something, but a Donald Trump self-made American billionaire, it's offensive to many of us to constantly hear that he's under the thumb of Vladimir Putin, of all-knowing Vladimir Putin. It's offensive for us to constantly be told that when there's no proof that's the case and when their past interactions have been so limited. It's just like the most baseless thing I've seen in a long time. And if there was something there... Uh, I'm not such a Trump groupie that I wouldn't cover it. If there was an interesting kind of computer forensic story there, I would for sure cover it. But there's nothing there. David, we also know from the WikiLeaks Podesta emails that Hillary and Podesta have been planning this to say that, that Trump was too cozy with Putin. That uh, So now the military industrial complex, we have Dick Cheney talking recently that if Russia did interfere, that's grounds for war. So I, I think the military industrial complex, you know, they basically have to have a new enemy. They had the war on terror. They've had a bunch of different enemies in the past. There needs to be a new enemy every X amount of years to justify an increase in military spending. And it appears that the new enemy that's been picked out is, is Putin, regardless of what he does or says. Yeah, it appears so. I mean, it's totally crazy that we have all of these bureaucrats and all of these talking heads on TV trying to push us toward war with Russia, to another nuclear power. We don't need war with them. They haven't attacked any of our interests. Uh, and I'm not like super pro-Russian. It's just it's an illogical enemy for us to focus on, especially when they want to partner with us on taking out ISIS. Like, let's take advantage of that, you know, buy one, get one free offer first. Uh, before we start making them an enemy. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not pro Russia either. I'm just anti war. I don't want to be involved in World War Three with a nuclear war, or I don't want to be involved in you know a cyber war where uh, they shut down our our power plants or our uh, or our power grid. So I don't want to be involved in those types of cyber attacks, which is you know some of the stuff that was revealed in the WikiLeaks Vault Seven that the CIA, in addition to the NSA, I know you've covered the NSA in the past, but the CIA has similar, they were in, I guess, a race against the NSA to acquire similar capabilities to where they can do hacks and then use Russian code or, or Chinese code or Iranian code and then blame it on another country, uh, country's hackers. Yeah, that Vault 7 stuff from WikiLeaks was pretty spooky stuff, as you were just alluding to. Uh, they can make it seem like the attack is being sourced in Russia or in the Ukraine or in China. They can make it seem like that's the origin point when it's really coming from hackers in the U.S. And nowhere in those documents did I see any, any policy or any regulations about not using the creepy uh, TV spying. I didn't see any regulations uh, excluding them from using that on Americans. You know, it seems like we have no real idea of who they're targeting 
And these programs are super creepy. You know, for people who don't know what I'm talking about, Vault 7 revealed that the CIA is working on surveillance tools that are way more advanced than people thought, including uh, malware programs that can live in your recycling bin so that traditional you know, antivirus software can't even pick it up. And also that Samsung TVs, possibly among other brands, uh, even when it looks like they're turned off, the CIA has malware they can inject into your TV, uh, an internet-connected TV. Uh, they can make it seem like your TV is off, but it's really recording your conversations in the room all night long, which is incredibly creepy. That's like, you know, 1984 realized. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I know of Vault 7 so far. And I also believe WikiLeaks has only released, uh, I think they've claimed only 1% or less of Vault 7. So there, we might be in for some big surprises. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more stuff to come. And WikiLeaks actually, the, for the first time in their history, I believe, they had to re redact thousands of names on documents. So they had never done that before. So they had to, because they didn't want to create a war, uh, the U.S. and CIA was spying on a bunch of you know politicians that were allies. They didn't want to create a war. So they had to remove people's names of documents of people who were already being spied on, like key political figures in other countries. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. So uh, things things are heating up. You, you know, David, about society, it's scary times. I mean, uh, decades ago, I don't think, uh, based on privacy, people wouldn't have allowed things like Alexa, you know, that, that uh, you know, Alexa, uh, order some more Coca-Cola for me, or Alexa, order an Uber cab, I need to go blah, blah, blah. Uh, and what people don't realize, I'm not sure if people realize this now, but those things are recording everything you say in the room. So, uh, you know, decades ago, I don't think people would have would have wanted one of those because it was such a restriction on personal freedom. But the the uh, American p people have changed so much now that it, it seems that people are OK with this. Yeah. And these people who own these companies are not all that trustworthy. I think Alexa is owned by Amazon, right? Uh, Yep, yep, and Google yeah, has so their Google has their own, and uh, as as I know, you and me have both had problems with uh, YouTube. Uh, YouTube destroyed our growth. We were growing at just about a thousand new subscribers a month, and now we're barely growing at a hundred new subscribers a month. Uh, so it's it's really frustrating what they've done uh, to us, and uh, you know all of our uh, analytics are down eighty percent across the board. So maybe David, we can uh, make a GoFundMe page. And I know other people who are pro-Trump or libertarian have also been affected with their channels. We can maybe do a GoFundMe page and start a class action lawsuit. I don't think we'll get rich from it, David, but you know what? We should demand transparency from Google and YouTube to show us their analytics and how they're uh, censoring us and screwing us over. Well, it is weird the kind of sudden reduction in new subscriber growth I've seen, but I don't know if that's because... I'm just already saturated or if they're actually, you know, messing with it. But all right, well, I guess we can talk more about that off the air. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, so you said things might get really bad. I, I think they could. I think when the full scope of all these, the full uh, scope of all these scandals emerges, people are going to feel totally betrayed by the mainstream media, probably totally betrayed by the CIA if they don't already uh, feel that way. Uh, and so, you know, they're going to feel totally betrayed by uh, different political figures who might be caught up with the Clintons or the Podestas or whoever. Uh, and so what's going to be left? You know, there's going to be a real scramble for uh, new things that we can trust. And, uh, you know, that's part of why I'm so interested in things like gold and silver and Bitcoin is it's to me a classic archaic revival ahead to borrow the idea that Terrence McKenna uh, came up with. Uh, an archaic revival is when a society jumps back to the last moment in time that made sense to that society. And the system we have right now doesn't make sense to a lot of people. We have propaganda on TV that tells us the president we just elected is such a bad person and is controlled by Russia, even though there's no evidence of that. We have a media that hasn't been able to read a single Podesta email on the air in uh, five months. Uh, so people are starting to feel like there's something a little weird here. It's not quite freedom yet. Uh, so uh, I do see things like sound money and things like a fair media uh, and censorship resistance. All of those things are what is going to move us forward, in my opinion. 
Yeah, and I interviewed you before your YouTube channel exploded. You were covering gold, silver, and Bitcoin, and that's how I found you. Uh, you were into Bitgold as well, and now it's become gold money. So I, I think you know people uh, really should research the Federal Reserve. Uh, if you went on the street, Mark Dice has done some of these great videos. If you went on the street and interviewed, you know, <laughs> I've, I've seen some of those. They're hilarious. Where he offers people like a candy bar. Or a thousand dollar gold coin or something, right? Yes, yes. Or a ten ounce bar of silver, or a, or a candy bar, and they choose the candy bar instead of the silver. And he's right next to a coin dealer, and you can get the silver verified. People just they they, they have no financial education. But most people, even if they have a business degree, even if they graduated from a good business school, they don't know what the Federal Reserve is and what it does, and you know how it's been inflating the money supply and bailing out you know Wall Street banks for making bad investments and causing financial crisis and bubbles and things like that. So uh, I, I've one of the reasons why I started my channel was to bring awareness to uh, about the Austrian School of Economics and the problems that the Federal Reserve has caused. I was really angry after the 2008 financial crisis. I thought the mainstream media was lying pathologically to me then. Uh, you know, they I, I don't know if you well, remember. That's, that's Jason. That's part of why I think this this kind of revolution in thought that's happening. It also has to happen on the media side, like definitely getting people into golden Bitcoin is important so that they're using rare money that's not just funny money created by bureaucrats who are killing us slowly through inflation. Uh, aside from that stuff, we need to totally restart the media. Like you're talking about YouTube, uh, you know, kind of kneecapping your growth. And I experienced something similar again. I don't know why, but uh, shouldn't they want to root for content creators that they're making money off of? Like what kind of shit is this that they're putting ideology ahead of simple business. Like we need to, if, if not create a new YouTube, then do something like you said and just put sufficient pressure on them to where they have to be transparent because you know some disgusting rap video with a bunch of blatant satanic imagery uh, will be monetized. And yet if I put up a video with Pizzagate in the title or with some other sensitive thing in the title, like Obama's a total disaster, for example, uh, if I make that my title, there's a 50% chance that that video will be demonetized without any explanation and without any transparency. And that to me just seems ideological, you know, because I'm not, I'm not publishing profane things. They're just things that somebody at YouTube doesn't want the masses to spend their time uh, thinking about. Yeah, I agree. It's very hypocritical. And Twitter does the Twitter and Facebook do the same thing to a certain extent. Twitter is particularly bad. I think Twitter was allowing, you know, ISIS to have their own page and, and endorse terrorism and tw and tweet out and while they were going after any, you know, libertarians and pro-Trump people and shadow banning them. So, I mean, that's enormously hypocritical. Twitter has gotten so far away from what made it popular to begin with, which is what, you know, it was this thing that you could talk about any issue and not be censored, uh, they've definitely gone in the wrong direction. I have no doubt that within the next couple of years, something smarter will come along and blow them away. Well, David, this is why no one wants to buy Twitter, because there's a lot of lawsuits coming and Twitter can't consistently make money. So they have a bunch of people tweeting stuff out. They have a bunch of angry people that they've censored and then they can't make any money consistently. So this is an enormous headache. This is why a lot of businesses uh, that have looked at buying out Twitter have passed on it right now. So, you know, uh, the, the technology stocks like Twitter that don't make any money, Snapchat just went IPO, these things are bubbles. I mean, these these things should not, this is kind of reminds me of the technology bubble 19. We don't have nearly as many crappy technology stocks that are going up for no reason, but we have a few that are like insane. Uh, there's no valuation whatsoever and the stock price just keeps going higher. Yeah, interesting point. Some of these apps have not been able to monetize. They have, you know, big viewerships, so to speak, but if a better app comes out for sharing photos or whatever, people will switch to that in 30 seconds. So there's not much barrier to entry. So um, I want to talk now about Obamacare and replacing it. You know, I hate Obamacare. My dad was a retired <laughs> my, my dad was yeah. a retired doctor. He got out of the industry. Uh, when I go to the doctor's office, there's not that many doctors. There's not that many nurses. It's mostly, you know, paper pushers, people right. filling out paperwork now there, and you get to spend a couple minutes with your doctor. It seems like the system, the patient's getting screwed, the doctor's getting screwed, and the costs keep going up, which is a disaster. Uh, who do, whose fault do you think what, was it for, for this disaster of a replacement for Obamacare? You think it was Paul Ryan and the other Rhino Republicans that were sabotaging, uh, that were sabotaging uh, Trump from making any real progress on it? 
Base, basically, yeah, that's my sense. I think that Trump wanted a really clean bill and wanted something that would accomplish what he, he told the voters he wanted to accomplish. And uh, these kind of professional compromisers uh, who don't see a mandate when they have one, you know, they don't see a mandate from the public to change something when they've been gifted it, uh, I think the blame has to be put on them. So, you know, what I've been hearing is Paul Ryan deserves some of the blame. And regardless of whether or not it's deserved, like he's the one who's going to face the blame for it. Uh, so I like the theory. I don't know if it's true or not, but I like this theory that Trump almost let that bill die uh, to get rid of Paul Ryan. Uh, so we'll see if that plays out or not. But uh, yeah, I, I think it fell short of expectations. And so uh, what's weird is if Obamacare keeps going, the costs are going to keep increasing. Uh, you know, within a year or two, people are going to beg for this thing to be uh, repealed because they won't be able to pay the premiums. Already the premiums are ridiculous in some states. I don't know how Paul Ryan and, and uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham can keep getting re-election. I know they get a lot of money from you know financial industry, Wall Street banks, and military industrial complex, but I can't believe their citizens would objectively look at what they've accomplished or not accomplished and uh, still keep them there. I, I can't believe they haven't been voted out yet. There, there has to be uh, you know, some type of like uh, back, uh, backdoor deals or something like that to make sure that they stay in office. Well, these all these photos of uh, John McCain being chummy with uh, George Soros, regardless of what the intent was there, it does not look good for him to be uh, hanging out with George Soros, who is the you know political mastermind funder of the other party like what is he doing it's like, almost like a person who shoots in the wrong direction on the basketball court <laughs> you know like what exactly is that about so i think that a number of moderate republicans are already distrustful of mccain uh for that reason alone uh so yeah i think those republicans mccain graham and of course paul ryan represent a more mainstream republican party that I think many of us rejected by voting in Trump. We want something different. You know, as much as the mainstream media attacks the alt-right, it's almost like anything the media shits on is a good thing because I think if you set aside the kind of anti-Semitic subculture that does bubble up in some portions of the alt-right, if you cut that out, it's actually uh, an emerging movement with a lot of good ideas. I think I maybe agree with 90% of what they say which is more than I can agree with Republicans or Democrats. Uh, so what do you think of the alt-right stuff? Well, I wouldn't consider myself alt-right. I would consider myself a uh, libertarian, which is more centrist. So, you know, I'm economically conservative and socially liberal. So I would consider myself uh -huh. more of a, you know, centrist type of person. But, you know, libertarians, in my opinion, are slandered by the mainstream media and, and Democrats, and they're called, you know, alt-right. They're called, like, far-right, which is mm -hmm. ridiculous because if you actually – took 10 minutes of research and Googled and looked at the policies, the which the average voter, most Americans are pretty lazy to do, although there are more uh, Americans that are becoming libertarians, but most Americans are too lazy to do this. If you actually looked at like what policies like libertarians are in favor of, you know, legalizing marijuana, uh, you know, things like that, that, that doesn't sound, you know, like a military industrial complex police state totalitarian. If you want to legalize marijuana and you want to cut people's taxes and you want the government to get out of people's lives and out of their bedroom and you want to put more money in their pocket and give them more freedom. Yeah, many of those sound like things that, that I can definitely support. So Yeah, so I think, you know, these labels with uh, alt right and far right, I I don't think they do they do any good, but the mainstream media likes calling calling uh people's names like that because then I guess it stops the average person from doing any research. So, you know, Ron Paul who I love who who uh I'm it looks like I'm gonna get to interview for the first time in May. Uh, I love Ron Paul, but, you know, he gets labeled when he goes on the mainstream media far right. I mean, the man is is rational. He's more like Thomas Jefferson of our time. I mean, he's just a true statesman. He's read so many books. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think he's far right at all. I think he just understands a lot of issues way better than the average talking head on the mainstream media who's like sucking up to a sponsor or their, you know, blind uh, ideologue. They're brainwashed. Well, they, they always frame the narrative by introducing people in ways like that. They don't introduce John McCain by saying, you know, globalist. Uh, so, yeah, interesting. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great point. So John McCain is, you know, war hero. He's not introduced as, you know, globalist, military industrial complex puppet, <laughs> Wall Street <laughs> puppet. You know, he's not he's not called anything like that. Uh, right. <laughs> well, uh, David, did you catch the Mike Cernovich uh, interview on 60 Minutes where uh, the, where he had the uh, the guy interviewing him squirming? <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was great, the part where the guy realized that he wasn't really operating as a journalist. You know, why would you trust what the campaign says for an indication about Hillary's health? Of course, they're in a position to lie about that because they're her campaign. You know, they're, they're not going to say, yeah, she gets sick some days. They're not going to make her look weak. Uh, so, yeah, I, I thought that was a great interview. Um, it's too bad that these things aren't live so that they can't weasel their way out by, you know, cutting parts out. Oh, yeah, the editing that they do that some of the mainstream media does is really totally deplorable. Uh, did you hear what I, I know they tried to screw you over on The Daily Show. I know they interviewed you at length. Did you hear what they did to Peter Schiff uh, years ago, a couple years ago? Well, they, they pre-interviewed me at length, and then they were supposed to fly out to Colorado uh, to interview me. And the day before they canceled, the day before they were going to send out their camera crew and their interviewer, uh, after wasting my time for weeks and after I'd already announced it to all of my viewers on YouTube. So it was like definitely made me look like an idiot for them to cancel one day before. Uh, but yeah, what did they do to Peter Schiff? Yeah, so Peter Schiff was arguing that the gov that politicians shouldn't set the minimum wage, that the market should set it. Market oh, yeah. should set wages. I, 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 I and so they he 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 lives around the New York City area or one of his houses is and he went into the studio, they record him for six hours talking about economic discussions, and he demanded to see the raw footage after they cut it down to thirty seconds and made it look like he hates uh, disabled people. So uh they had six hours of footage. They spent hours editing it down to 30 seconds to make him look like he hates disabled people. So that's it's and he demanded afterwards that they release the raw footage and they told him to go screw himself. Well, what's interesting is these so-called comedy shows, SNL and The Daily Show, they act like they're just giving us comedy, but it's very structured political propaganda uh, masquerading as comedy. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it is funny, but. Uh, it's so obvious sometimes. Like when I watch Bill Maher, the few times that I still watch it, it's very rare nowadays because I don't respect him that much. Uh, but when I do watch it, I'm like, wow, this isn't just to make people laugh. This is like bludgeoning home a certain political point of view. And more importantly, it's about them like taking out the political views that they don't consider to be orthodox. You know, they're using comedy to tell us, like, oh, these views aren't acceptable. Don't go in this direction. You have to mock Trump nonstop. You can't actually think for yourself and realize how corrupt the Democrats are and how corrupt the media itself is. You have to just criticize Trump on these really superficial uh, kind of class war uh, talking points. And that's what they're doing is they're like, oh, it's funny to do this. No, it's not funny. It's borderline sedition. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I agree, man. Actually, if you go back, have you, have you heard of Antonio Gramsci? No, who's that? Uh, he was a hardcore Marxist. He initially came out of Benito Mussolini's uh, fascist uh, regime, I believe. Uh, he was involved in that, but he came to the United States and he realized that the average American would inherently reject communism because they wanted their freedom and they wanted the economic opportunity. So he came up with a plan to slowly like embed communism into the uh, in, and destroy um, the American family and the American economy. And his goal was to create government schools with a set thing of curriculum and to take over the media and have exact specific talking talking points which were you know anti anti family uh, anti normal family and anti capitalism and things like that so the he was writing about this uh, uh, basically a hundred years ago interesting yeah something something for you to research later now you talked about uh, I saw some good documentaries on Gramsci I think uh, he was mentioned in in Dinesh D'Souza's new one uh, new documentary uh, now, you mentioned corruption. Uh, James Comey, the FBI director, Trump's got to fire this guy. I mean, <laughs> you got to look at the background of Com Comey was getting paid, David. S you need to do some videos about this. Six million dollars a year for working for the military industrial complex. And then to basically he was hired as a fixer for uh, HSBC Bank to help make with his, you know, government contacts there their money laundering charges go away for laundering billions of dollars in drug cartel money. And yet then he becomes the head of the FBI. And I think one his brother, Peter Comey, did the taxes for the Clinton Foundation too. Uh, 
Well, I don't think uh, I don't think that Trump or the Trump administration holds it against anybody for having made a lot of money in the past. You know, you look at Rex Tillerson's salary, way more than uh, anybody's, right? When he was at Exxon Mobil. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think it is troubling that Comey. Uh, has not moved things forward fast enough with this investigation surrounding Anthony Weiner's laptop. You know, what the hell is going on there? It was like, I think early last month, the Wall Street Journal put out an article saying that the feds were weighing uh, child porn charges against Anthony Weiner. What's taking them so long? Apparently, they have 650,000 emails. There should be a lot of stuff there for them to determine if they should charge him and if they should move forward seems like there's just a freeze on all this stuff. So Comey, uh, I think, needs to explain to the American people there why there's a delay. And then, the you know, kind of going back and forth uh, in the days up until the election, that struck some people as political. And I believe our FBI director is supposed to always be perceived as a law enforcement officer, not as a politician brokering deals, right? And so yes. why wasn't there just a very simple and clear-cut explanation of these questions the American people had? Why were things like Hillary's emails politicized? Why wasn't there just, you know, with absolute fact, uh, statements made about whether or not she had done something wrong, which now we know it seems like she has? I, I heard rumors, David, that Comey was afraid of Loretta Lynch, the attorney general, and he was afraid of uh, her trying to go after him and putting him in prison. And she's enormously corrupt. Eric Holder, who was attorney general before her, you know, he had scandal after scandal, enormously corrupt. Uh, both of them, I think, were involved in funneling billions of dollars in fines that uh, that Wall Street banks and other corporations paid to the Department of Justice for, you know, a bunch of different fines into, uh, you know, uh, into basically democratic uh, operation organizations like George Soros and David Brock type of type of uh, charities that they run and stuff to fund mm -hmm. uh, political operations. So, uh, which is illegal, but they were doing it. So, I mean, these, it, it seems to me that there's good hardworking people in the FBI, uh, the agents who had that information. I had also heard, David, that the 650,000 emails you mentioned that Loretta Lynch was ordered that they be destroyed. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure oh. if that's true or not, but, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's that's totally the opposite of what a Justice Department should do, right? <laughs> well, I, I, exactly. And as Gerald Salente just says, you know, the people at the top, the elites, they, church, they try to protect themselves. It seems the political appointees at the top of all these organizations, the Department of Justice, the FBI, the CIA, uh, before Trump took over, you know, they were enormously corrupt. So they were ordering, you know, basically Obama or people under him were ordering spying on their enemies and things like that. And there was other, you know, corrupt deals. Uh, the South Korean president, uh, to give people an example of corruption, the South Korean president, one of her friends uh, in their cabinet used uh, their post to get uh, a really good lucrative contract and make money. I mean, that shit happens, David, in the United States every day and people don't get impeached. And the South Korean president, you know, it's a huge scandal in South Korea about impeachment, about they're shocked about this much corruption. I mean, this shit happens in the United States on a daily basis and no one goes to prison for it. It's so sad. Yeah, it's very true. Okay, David, well, uh, I enjoyed this discussion and I really hope, you know, that the charges do start to come. You know, I heard, I heard in January uh, from one of my contacts here in DC who works next to the FBI building that, the charges were going to come for Republicans and Democrats to this pedophilia ring. You know, the, the whole Pizzagate thing that the media tries to label it as, it's a lot bigger than that. This was. A oh, definitely. It's a, this is an international scandal. Yes. And we're talking about child abuse by elites in multiple countries over many years. And it's way more than was there a, a basement in a pizza shop where Hillary Clinton was killing children herself? No, nobody is claiming that. Nobody reasonable. And yet that's the bar that the media set. And they're like, oh, okay, well, we disprove this aspect, so there's nothing here. Wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot here that doesn't make any sense. It seems like there is child trafficking occurring, right? So. Well, did, did you see the uh, SGT report? My friend Sean over at SGT report just put out a video yesterday, and he was showing how NBC was running, how there was pedophilia scandals in the State Department in 2013. 
how there was, uh, you know, diplomats connected to the U.S. State Department and other State Department employees involved in a pedophilia ring and that, you know, people were ordered to kill the investigation. This was NBC reporting in 2013. So they're acting like this is revisionist history. I mean, they reported on this in the past. We have, you know, uh, other scan other pedophile rings in L.A. and Norway. I think London, there was one that was busted recently. So we are seeing them all over the globe go down. I'm just shocked that the people at the top involved in this haven't gone down yet. Yeah, hopefully soon. Well, uh, I, I really enjoy speaking to you, David. Uh, keep up the good work. You're you're a brave guy. I know you've had to put up with a lot in order to in order to talk about the things you want to talk about. Now it's been very frustrating. I've followed along how your accounts have been frozen. You're getting uh, you know constantly trolled and death threats, and you had to shut down your social media. So you're one brave dude now for all the stuff that you have to put up with. Thank you. Yeah, it's nothing compared to what some of these victims have gone through, obviously, but uh, it, it's crazy. And what it does is it actually fortifies you because it shows you that there's something here. Like I, I was in corporate media when I was younger. And as you know, Jason, if the media doesn't want to cover something, they just ignore it. They just let it die on the vine. They don't come out with all these pieces attacking you. Uh, so they're very scared by this pedophilia ring stuff that everybody's starting to buzz about in independent media. They're so scared of it, and they don't have a proper answer to debunk it. So they're just rolling out, you know, ad hominem and threats. And even Alex Jones has had to watch his words lately. And uh, it's a weird time, but I, I definitely think there are too many people in government. You mentioned the FBI. I think there are too many people who did get into it for more or less the right reasons. And hopefully they will uh, bring prosecution soon. Well, uh, thank you for pursuing the truth, David. I really appreciate it. I know you've had to deal with a lot of a lot of stuff in order to uh, release your videos lately. Uh, you know what I'd also like to see? I'd like to see someone brave enough, an entrepreneur out there, create a libertarian or limited censorship video upload website that's not controlled by uh, you know Eric Schmidt, who's uh, Hillary Clinton's marketing director, or uh, you said on Vimeo that one of the Vimeo co-founders is friends with Hillary Clinton, right? Yeah, so uh, Barry Diller, the chairman of IAC, uh, IAC owns Vimeo, and uh, he's been invited to dinners with uh, with his wife and with Hillary before. So there's definitely a close Clinton tie in there, and I think IAC also has Chelsea Clinton on their board of directors. So just a very politically entrenched company. Uh, I agree with you. It'd be great to see a simple upload service of some kind where we know that it's not going to be censored unless we're saying something illegal, and where we know that the view count and the subscriber count are not messed with. I mean, how hard can it be to launch a service like that? It can't be impossible. Yeah, and there's already Gab.ai to compete with Twitter, and I think it's actually in a lot of aspects better than Twitter already. Oh, yeah, I definitely skim a lot of people's accounts on Gab, and uh, I think the fact that it allows you to post longer messages than Twitter does is part of why it's so interesting because you still can't post like a long article, but you can definitely get in a couple paragraphs. And so it's a cool service. Uh, in wrapping up this interview, David, uh, where can our listeners fi uh, find your content? You have your YouTube channel and you also have a new, a new news uh, website, right? Yeah, the news website we're doing is fulcrum.news. So that's the best place to keep in touch with my work. And then uh, if you use YouTube, if you just search for my name, uh, and subscribe to my channel. You can get all the videos that way too. Excellent. Well, thank you for your time, David, and uh, keep up the good work. You too, Jason. Thanks a lot. Let's uh, do this again sometime. I always enjoy talking to you as well. You're very informed on these issues, and uh, you being so close to the action in D.C., it's always fun to hear what's up. So, Mo and I are trying to raise $1,000 per month for our Patreon account. We have over 2,600 viewers per YouTube video, so if we can get most of our loyal listeners or all of our loyal listeners to donate a dollar per month or f or up to five dollars per month which would be amazing that would cover most if not all of the money that we need so uh we also accept one-time donations if you go to the wall street for mainstreet.com website uh we accept donations in cash uh via paypal fiat you can donate there uh you can donate uh bitcoin through our Bitcoin wallet there on the website, or you can donate gold and silver. We have a gold money account, and we also accept mail donations of physical gold and silver. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and uh, we appreciate any and all help. Please forward it to friends. Okay, bye.